Museums, schools, colleges, and university courses in biology emphasize variation within a kind as evidence for evolution. For example, the Natural History Museum in London says that breeding of dogs shows evolution. Presumably, all you have to do is breed dogs for long enough and you'll get something which is not a dog, something that is basically different. To the uninformed, that can seem convincing. After all, there are many and varied breeds of dogs. However, the evidence from breeding in the science of genetics actually presents a huge problem for evolution. In spite of much breeding and the generation of many varieties of dogs, from Chihuahuas to Great Danes, dogs are still dogs. Dogs have only ever bred dogs. Roses have only ever bred roses. As a biologist with a PhD in plant physiology and over 20 years research experience, including the breeding of fruit trees, I believe genetics holds major problems for evolutionists. Why? Because there is no mechanism for the acquisition of new, more complex characteristics in living things. There is no means of generating the new genetic information required. Evolution from microbes to man requires such a mechanism. A recent survey of students before and after a genetics course at Central Michigan University showed that the number of students believing in evolution declined from 81% before the course to 62% after, although the course was almost certainly taught from an evolutionary perspective. If the course had been taught without the inevitable evolutionary bias, the shift in attitude towards creationism might have been even greater. Dogs breeding dogs? That's not evolution. Written by Don Batten. How can one basic kind of organism change into something fundamentally different? A pig farmer in the UK heard an evolutionist academic talk about how breeding of farm animals shows evolution. At the end of the lecture, the pig farmer said, Professor, I don't understand what you're talking about. When I breed pigs, I get pigs. If it were not so, I would be out of business. The evolutionist, Dr. Keith Stewart Thompson said, Evolution is both troubled from without by the nagging insistence of anti-scientists and nagged from within by the troubling complexities of genetic and developmental mechanisms and new questions about the central mystery, speciation itself. In other words, how can the incredibly complex biochemical systems in living things come about by any conceivable natural process? And then how could random changes in such complex systems change them into something else, something fundamentally new? What Thompson said 13 years ago has been amplified by the studies in molecular biology since then. Every new discovery should be another nail in the coffin of naturalistic origins that is, evolution. At the University of Sydney, I sat in on a biochemistry course covering the operation of a bacterial gene which coded for the enzyme complex which breaks down lactose, the milk sugar. The enzymes are produced only if lactose is available. I found it fascinating. The system was so beautifully designed and finely tuned to what it did. An end-of-course discussion time saw a student ask the lecturer how such a system could evolve. The answer? It couldn't. Such integrated and complex systems cannot come through chance random processes. For example, mutations. Dr. Michael Deaton, a molecular biologist, spelled out the problem in his book Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. Dr. Denton, although not a Christian or a creationist, acknowledges the problem for the idea of chance processes generating living things or generating new genetic information. Denton's book was published in 1985, but it has not dated in any substantial area. Although written by an expert in his field, the book is quite readable. There is no known natural process for generating new, more complex traits. If a reptile changed into a bird, the reptile would have to along with many other improbable changes, acquired the ability to produce feathers. 
To get a reptile to produce feathers requires new genes to produce the proteins necessary for the production of feathers. The chance of natural processes creating a new gene coding for a protein fundamentally different to those already present is essentially zero. New species can't and have formed if by definition we mean something which cannot breed with other species of the same genus, but this is not evidence for evolution. The new species has no new genetic information. For example, a new species has arisen in Drusophila, the ferment fly so popular in undergraduate genetics laboratories. The new species cannot breed with the parent species but is fertile with its own type, so it is, by definition, a new species. However, there is no new genetic information, just the physical rearrangement of the genes on one chromosome, technically called a chromosome translocation. To get evolution from bacteria to Bach requires incredible amounts of new information to be added. Typical bacteria have about 2,000 proteins. A human has about 100,000. At every upward step of evolution, there needs to be new information added. Where does it come from? Not from mutations. They degrade information. Carl Sagan, ardent evolutionist, admitted in the following. Mutations occur at random and are almost uniformly harmful. It is rare that a precision machine is improved by a random change in the instructions for making it. There are many breeds of pigeons, cattle, horses, dogs, etc. But they are all pigeons, cattle, horses, dogs, etc. Recombination of existing genes can produce enormous variety within a kind, but the variation is limited to the genes present. If there are no new genes present for producing feathers, you can breed reptiles for a billion years and you will not get anything with feathers. Polyploidy, that is the multiplication of the number of chromosomes, chromosome translocations, recombination, and even possibly mutations can generate new species, but not new information, not new characteristics for which there are no new genes to start with. It is possible for mutation breeding to generate new varieties with traits which are improved, from man's point of view. That is to say, shorter wheat plants, different protein quality, low levels of toxins, etc. Where such improvements have been investigated on a molecular basis, researchers have found that the new trait is not due to the appearance of a new protein, but the modification of an existing one, even when it seems to be a new trait, such as an herbicide resistance. Herbicides often work by fitting into an enzyme, a bit like a key in a lock. The presence of the wrong key stops the protein or enzyme from accepting the correct key, the chemical compound that it normally works on, and so the plant dies. Herbicide resistance can be due to a mutation in the gene coding for the enzyme so that a slightly modified enzyme is produced which the herbicide molecule no longer fits. The enzyme may still do its usual job sufficiently well for the plant to survive. However, such a plant is normally less fit to survive in the wild, away from the herbicide, because the modified enzyme is no longer as efficient at doing its normal job. In the whole creation and evolution debate, keep in mind that variation within a kind, such as through breeding or adaptation, is not evolution. All the biological and genetic evidence for evolution is actually variation within a kind, not evolution at all. This includes peppered moths, bacterial resistance to antibiotics, insecticide resistance, horse evolution, Galapagos finches, arctic terns, and so on. Creationists recognize the role of natural selection in today's world in changing gene frequencies in populations, but this has nothing to do with evolution of some mythical simple life form into a human over billions of years because natural selection cannot generate new information, nor can mutations, multiplication of the number of chromosomes, etc. Evolutionists often call the natural variations in living things microevolution. This misleads people into thinking that since such variations are real, Therefore, evolution itself, from molecules to man, is proven. There is no logical connection between varying gene frequencies and populations of peppered moths, for example, and the origin of the genes themselves, which is what evolutionists claim the theory explains. 
In a recent paper, evolutionist Dr. George Gabor Miklo summed it up nicely when he said, We can go on examining natural variation at all levels, as well as hypothesizing about speciation events in bedbugs, bears, and brachiopods until the planet reaches oblivion. But we still only end up with bedbugs, brachiopods, and bears. None of these body plans will transform into rotifers, roundworms, or rhynchoseals. God created all kinds of living things with a genetic capacity for variation by the rearranging of the genetic information, the genes, through the reproductive process. However, the variation is basically limited to what is available in the created genes, with the addition of some extra variation due to non-lethal mutations in the original genes. The extra variations in humans caused by genetic mutations probably include such visible things as freckly skin, blue eyes, blonde hair, inability to roll the tongue, lack of earlobes, and male pattern baldness. Things reproduce according to their kind, just like the Bible says, Genesis 1.11, and 12, 21, 24, and 25. They always have and they always will while ever this world exists. Dr. Jonathan Sarfati's best-selling book, The Genesis Account, is some 800 pages. This book is arguably the most comprehensive book on biblical creation ever written, and it comes from the author of some of the most well-known books on the subject, including Refuting Evolution, which remains the largest-selling creation book of all time. Our team of scientists and experts and our video production team worked really hard for two years to bring to you the information of the Genesis account in a Bible study course, and we're excited to tell you that it's available as the Genesis Academy. This 12-part course makes it easy to continue the teaching on origins in further depth. Targeted for lay audiences, each video in the 12-part series is no more than 40 minutes in length, so it's ideal for adults in teen Sunday school, Bible studies, or even Sunday night screenings. All the presentations have high-quality visuals and footage to keep viewers engaged. Many believers are excited to learn more to face skeptics' challenges. Our hope is that the Genesis Academy will become an essential staple for every church. It is so important to get a correct understanding of the Bible's foundational chapters right, and this series achieves just that. The Genesis Academy comes with a free online study guide so that you can follow along. It's available now in the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, and Europe, and a few other countries. Get the Genesis Academy for your group today at creation.com academy. I am Joseph Darnell. For everyone at CMI, thanks for listening.